Hello, everyone. A very, very, very warm welcome to the How Hebel and Move. A very warm welcome also to Berlinale Talents. And uh, looking at you is great. Uh, I can tell you, you are in best company. And you're, for those who are joining us for the very first time, I don't know if there is any, um, you are in best company also of uh, the 200 talents we've been bringing to Berlin. Berlinale Talents is a place where this community of filmmakers from 65 different countries are coming together this year under the topic common tongues uh, speaking out in the language of cinema. So we are delving into the different and many ways and languages uh, the cinema can actually present and speak. And uh, this uh, also in hind is, I think, also a very, very good introduction to the guests you're all uh, waiting for desperately. But it is also something we can actually uh, do here in the room because I would like to use that opportunity to use the language you can only speak with your hands to welcome the moderator of today's session, uh, which I'm very, very happy and proud to present. It's Joanna Hock. Please come on stage. Thank you, Johan. I'm going to jump right in because we've got a limited amount of time and we all know what we're here for. Um, but I, I, I wanted to say that the last time I saw Martin in London, which was actually just a few weeks ago, um, we touched on the talk uh, that we're doing today, uh, as I was leaving, uh, we were saying goodbye, and, um, and Martin asked me, have I seen all of Chantal Ackerman's films? And I thought, that's interesting. I'm not sure how that uh, relates to our talk. And then he said, I'm going to see a number of them before the talk. And then I realized he thought the talk was going to be about my work, not his. So I said, <laughs> so I said this uh, Marty, is about you. It's about your films. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that because it's an indication of this man's um, incredible generosity and support uh, and interest in other people and what they're doing and an incredible compassion for the world. And um, it's an opportunity for me to thank him for all the support he's given me, but not only myself, but many, many other filmmakers and cinema in general. We're all incredibly grateful. Um, and for me, it's, uh, I think it's a very unusual thing that this generosity of spirit, this beautiful soul that Marty has, is combined with being uh, really the greatest living film director we have. So um, I want you to give a very warm welcome to Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Oh my. Thank you. Wow. So, <laughs> uh, I wanted to jump right into uh, filmmaking, or filmmaking itself, and it always strikes me that whenever I, in a rare occasion, I see a director working, that uh, what you're dealing with every day are very practical things, and often with a big crew, and I'm interested in how you keep your vision of what you want to do, your ideas intact with all this kind of craziness around? I, I think it has a lot to do with the preparation that I, I work on, which is um, um, I usually try to um, lock myself away for at least 10 days or almost two weeks just to sit with the script and um, the ideas of the script and try to come up with a visualization of the picture. Um, th that is in a sense, really um, uh, designing um, certain editing sequences, but at the same time also allowing, let's say, I don't know, five or six pages of dialogue and saying, no, that's going to depend on the location, that's going to depend on you know, the, day, the, the time of day in shooting, and, and then really it's a matter of um, 
uh, sometimes uh, who's in the frame and who isn't in a, a, a scene that takes place between two people, for example. Um, but that changes, for example, that, that frees me in a way so that that section of the script, um, when I get the location or I get the set, I could then rework it with the actors so that, that it's, still, it's still alive in a way. Um, uh, it, I have to figure out, too, whether I even need wide shots, in a sense, of something like that. But I usually like, I really like to think about what I used to call um, the philosophy of the shot. You know, what the shot is saying. Um, uh, it, does, it have a, does it have a narrative point to it? Um, uh, and if it's a tracking shot, the head of the shot, the tail of the shot, um, where we start and where we end. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very difficult because you tend to, I like moving camera, but at the same time, we tend to say, okay, we're going to start the shot here and track all along the audience right this way. But I know now over the years that I lose the head and tail of the shot. So maybe I want to start a little sooner in here and move it this way, but it's not long enough, so I've got to go back a bit. So it's that kind of thing. And should, should, the, uh, should the camera be on an angle, or should it be on an angle, or should it be just like a Godardian kind of parallel track head on. And so that, that really is a, a different effect in the, to the viewer, you know, particularly if you're head on and you're tracking, you know? And I kind of like that, just moving back and forth this way, following. I remember a scene in Viva Savi where um, um, Anna Karina, uh, the guy comes in and asks for a Judy Garland record and it just tracks through the record store and she goes and gets the record and just tracks back. And it, it had a kind of clarity, um, and uh, it said so much about the quotidian work that she was doing, the daily work. Uh, and it didn't interfere, and it didn't impress, it didn't force the audience uh, to make, it wasn't forcing a comment, but you felt you were there with her in a way, and, and almost her boredom, in a sense, uh, of what she was doing in that film. But do you think, though, when you're in that moment um, of shooting something like that, have you, have you already worked that out? As you say, you storyboard and you prepare a lot, yeah. but, uh, but do you often, at the, in the moment, see something and think, well, I want, to, I want to capture it actually a different way because it's worked out differently in well, front that, of you? That, 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 that is also, that's also the... Uh, there's a double-edged sword there in that if we're really moving quickly, and, for example, we're in a, low, we're in a situation where the budget... And the time, I know I need that shot. I know that's the shot that's going to tell me something. On the other hand, if I have some extra time and I find something with the actor, or he or she, I tend to say, okay, I can cover that this way, or I can do it in this, or could we combine it in the shot? But, you know, it's, it's difficult, because if you're doing a parallel track and you have the actor coming in, in and out, so to speak, forward and back, that changes the tone of the, of the shot. So um, um, that's got to be taken into consideration. Um, again, it's an interesting thing. Sometimes more time is a problem because you tend to add more shots. And um, I, I like to think of the shots, uh, um, how should I say? Mm, I like to think of it as a very precise process. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily like shooting you know, uh, so much footage that we wind up doing it only in the editing. You follow? Yes, yeah. And do you think that thinking has come partly because you began as an editor, in fact? Yes, I think so. I, I think so. I think I was very affected by, uh, there's no doubt, I was very affected by American films, Hollywood films. And when I say that, um, you know, you're talking of the grand style of, um, you know, William Myler, John Ford, um, Howard Hawks, the wide shot, uh, the long takes. Now, you've got to understand that when I saw them in the 1940s, I was maybe seven or eight years old or whatever, five years old. But when I saw them, those screens were built for a place like this. It was a giant screen, even bigger. So that a wide shot played, you know, from, they call it the American shot, from right below the knee up. And you could let it play. And as television came in and things like that, well, you know, the images started to change. And so for me, I began noticing editing. Um, of course, when I saw... Um, Orson Welles' as Citizen Kane, on television, by the way, with commercials. <laughs> it was so awful, but, but, you know, it didn't matter. At that time, it was, only, it was the only way you could see it. Then The Third Man, 
Carol Reed's Third Man, which was shot in Vienna. And then, uh, of course, I found myself going to these obscure theaters in New York, and the real awakening was um, really the Soviet uh, editing of uh, Padovkin, uh, Tsigur Bertov, and, um, well, uh, you know, Eisenstein. And so this, for me, was very exciting. Right at the same time, the editing uh, was being uh, redefined by the French and the Italian New Wave by Godard and Truffaut and, 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 and uh, Rivette and so many others. And in Italy, you had, you know, uh, the humanism of Olmi, for example, uh, with uh, Il Posto and the beautiful film The Fiancés. Um, this is before he made The Tree of the Wooden Clogs. And then you had the younger directors. You had uh, Bertolucci and Bellocchio, and they were redefining it. Uh, the poetry was right there up front with Pasolini, in a way. Um, the, the lens as a, as a, a stilo, you know, the, the, the pen of the poet, in a way. And so there was um, uh, the early, late 50s and early 60s was a very, very important time for redefining what, how you tell a story with pictures, uh, let alone uh, Fellini's films and, and then the, 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 uh, the 360, no, the 180, I'd say, uh, in style of Antonioni, which made us rethink a screen time you know, and, and uh, uh, taught us a great deal about, about structure in, in editing. So, it, yeah, interesting to absorb all those different, very different styles all, in a All way. at the same time, yeah. by the way. Yeah. All at the same time. And, I, and going through all of that, you had Bergman. Bergman was always there. Every year was always like, like there was the Bergman film. And we, like, got so spoiled. You know, it's, oh, another Bergman. It's got to be good. You know, and there may, may be some, uh, I think uh, some people uh, don't understand that at that time, uh, his films were revolutionary uh, in a way, particularly that trilogy that he did um, uh, that ends with Through Glass Darkly. And then he took off and did Persona, and that became something else entirely. He was reaching out and uh, finding new territory, the, pretty much the way Fellini did and Antonioni did with Red Desert, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting because I haven't really thought. Uh, the way you're describing it, you think of your cinema and how your 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 there are elements of all those filmmakers you've mentioned in a way that you but then you're making it your own and the, and the um, well the spiritual side obviously of Bergman's work and then the expressionist style that you describe. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's. Uh, I think I think the key was um, the key was. Uh, again, coming from a, a family that was literate, but there were no books in the house, so I had to learn to read novels or read history books. Um, and uh, it took me a long time to learn how to live with a book, in a way, um, and uh, not to be intimidated by it, uh, the length, etc. cetera. Um, and so, for me, um, the literature I was, I was exposed to at the time was Graham Greene and Dostoevsky, and, um, uh, oh, my, uh, Melville, and, and that sort of thing. And so, for me, Dostoevsky was the key, um, Notes from Underground and Brothers Karamazov. But the um, interesting thing in terms of um, the spirituality was Dostoevsky, but also Pasolini's Akatone. Akatone. Yeah, yeah. That was a film that actually spoke to me directly about, um, you know, the world I, I came from, so to speak. Which, which I want to go into that in more depth. And I want to just staying on the film set for a bit longer. I'm looking at your shoes, oh. which are really beautiful. And you, you, <laughs> you, 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 you mentioned to me the other day about shoes being really important to you when you're on set. Well, yes, because um, one thing a director really has to have, as best as he, as he or she can, is to have strong legs. Because you have to keep getting up, jumping up, and you need your knees. You know, you don't, the knees start to go. It's a problem. So the shoes are really important. Um, and so uh, over the years, like I did Mean Streets, I had fry boots at that time. Western boots was kind of a thing in the early 70s in L.A. You, you went cowboy, you know. And um, it also was a way to get away from where I came from. I was redefining. My, I get, people tell me now, you're reinventing yourself. Yeah, that's what we were doing. You know, um, and so the next year I did a film called Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, and at that time we were in Arizona, in um, New Mexico, and um, 
um, was that, I, no, it was in Tucson, Arizona. And I was told that, you know, you really need earth shoes. I don't know if anybody remembers what, them. What are earth shoes? I don't know. They're, they're, they're not very nice looking, but they were really comfortable. That was part of the whole earth catalog and that sort of thing in the 60s. And things that we do now that is, that, that basically, a, a lot of it is common sense now, but at that time was considered radical, you know. And so uh, earth shoes, and that gave way then to, you know, um, Shooting in the city, which was different. Shooting in the city, I was able to use regular shoes, like two-tone shoes and that sort of thing. The thing about the shoes is very important because, you know, if you're sitting a lot and you're moving a lot, I like to look at them. <laughs> and it, it makes me think. I'm seeing perforated tips here, and it makes me think while I'm, while I'm waiting. I'm waiting, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. I like to look at it. Um, oh, it's true, it's true, because it, it, it focuses your, your attention. You know, yeah. and so the only problem is, I must say, as you as you get older, uh, you know, you do need more comfortable stuff. And so um, I did revert to these. Um, uh, uh, their sneakers called Nokas or something like that. They're, they're, they have a really good thick um, sole to them, and they actually was great because when you got up from the, your chair, you could be propelled forward <laughs> and just dash into everybody and then pull back. And it was kind of interesting because I, I was able to keep my balance on them, but that was good. That was good, but not all the scenes. Other scenes, I had very nice shoes. So, so the shoes influenced the films, in fact. Oh, totally for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the other shoes I had made, I had made suede shoes with white stitching, so I could look at the stitching. I mean, that's a that's a. Uh, you don't need that, okay? <laughs> but after all these years, I figured, well, what the hell, you know? Uh, no, it's re it's great. I think it's time uh, to see our first clip.
Well, um, I mean, there are a lot of things to talk about from that scene, but I, I, what I, uh, when I rewatched it recently, what I picked up uh, particularly, apart from the amazing performances, and I think that De Niro's presence, he's just so, it's, uh, it's just so palpable. It's so, he's so extraordinary. But it, it's just this idea that um, you become your job. Um, and I wondered, uh, as a film director, what, how, how does the job of being a film director affect you in your life? Um, I mean, I, maybe to explain further in terms of the question, I mean, I find that I, I think I catastrophize a lot. I, I dramatize things, and I try and control other people's conversations. And I, you know, I just wonder what... Maybe That's it's just a direct... It. That's about right, yes, yeah. I've been told I've been overly dramatic in my life, you know, catastrophize. You're absolutely right, because most things are a catastrophe. And um, all you could do is write it out. You know, I feel like wizard here. You know, um, he doesn't give him really any advice. It's um, the advice is to hang in and um, write out the storm because it's a storm. You know, it's beautiful. There's beauty in it, but it's a storm. Um, and that's why I... I I haven't seen this scene, I think, maybe in 40 years. Wow. Yeah. And I'm interested. I remember now, frame by frame in the editing, making sure that um, uh, there was enough of silences in it. And De Niro's, um, um, it, his, his hesitations, his hesitation, when he finally does say something, there's a line I remember best was, you know, I got some bad ideas in my head. And uh, he, gets, he has that smile when he says it because he's embarrassed by it. And uh, he's horrified at his own thoughts. And uh, tragically, it comes to play at the end of the story. But in any event, um, we played in the uh, editing on that um, uh, of um, primarily elongating that performance, really. The hesitation, the hesitation, the hesitation. All of, and all those hesitations ultimately building up to the violence in the picture, you know. Um, this was, um, yeah, this was, we cut this in 75, the film was released in 76. But, um, uh, again, um, um, a, shooting so quickly um, at that time, designed the shot, there's a storyboard for it, uh, it's outside the Belmore Cafeteria. The Belmore Cafeteria was a famous uh, all-night cafeteria for uh, cab drivers. Cab drivers frequented it. And so uh, it's closed now, but uh, we made sure that Michael Chapman and I had the, the Belmore reflection behind them, that the cab is in a certain way there in the right of the frame. And then when De Niro shot, he's single. He's single. And what I, what I decided throughout the movie as best as possible was to isolate him so that when we talk about what a shot means, whenever we shoot uh, uh, De Niro's character in the film, he's single in the frame. And when he are on other people, he's usually in their frame. And so it kind of, kind of is off-putting in a way. He's never part of them. And so you see a little of that here, you know. But uh, can becoming what you are, I, I mean, I, I, you know, can you direct your life? I don't see how you can. You try, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you, when we were talking about this the other day, you mentioned Basil Fulty. And for anyone yes. who doesn't know who Basil Fawlty is, he well, was, it was yes. a 70s uh, sitcom called Fawlty Towers. But I wonder what, what you have in common with Basil Fawlty, because it's well, very hard to see. Of, of every little thing that bothered him, every petty thing, stuff that you shouldn't let, you know, stuff that you should meditate and get transcend. No, if you actually start, you know, if you actually say, well, you know, the floor is this way, and that's... And so he gets annoyed at every, He lets everything get him. And the best thing to do is to, uh, uh, Basil, faulty, the best thing to do is to just jump into it, accept it, and just complain about everything. <laughs> complain about everything, about the weather, about the people, about this, about that, until finally the absurdity of it makes itself clear, and you start to laugh. Uh, there's a famous scene, I think, in Faulty Towers where he has this silly car, I forget what it is, a, it's a small car, a little red car. A mini, maybe. A mini, a mini Cooper, I think it is. And um, uh, at one point, the car always keeps, always keeps uh, uh, breaking down. And at one point, he's in the middle of uh, the field or uh, forest or whatever, 
and he's frantic because he's in trouble. He's got to get, he's got to get someplace. And the car breaks down and he gets out and he says to the car, okay, that's it. And he takes a twig and starts hitting the car, <laughs> which I thought was, <laughs> of course, it's not the car's fault. It's his fault, you know? <laughs> And so, once you understand the absurdity of it all, it's good. I, for me, I, I like complaining about it. Yeah. Yeah. I like complaining about everything. And I think, but honestly, too, I, I think what happens for me is that because um, you've got to get through it. And if it's inconvenient, it's too bad. You know, you've got to accept it. It's like, uh, I, for many years, after making the lower budget films, when the films got a little, uh, when I had longer shooting schedules at times, I think it was King of Comedy, I would show up very late because King of Comedy became a film that I took on uh, as a kind of, uh, almost like, uh, I was convinced by De Niro to do it. And I wasn't quite ready for it because I didn't realize how much of myself was in it. And I was mortified by it. And every day, um, despite the fact that the actors were there and everything, I would always be late. Yeah. How late? Oh, some, a couple of days, um, I wasn't feeling well. And, uh, no, this was a, a serious kind of, I, I could not bring myself to deal with these characters. And uh, De Niro was fine, Diane Abbott, um, the Sandra Bernhardt, Lewis was fine, Jerry Lewis. But uh, I began to realize that ultimately, by, and it took about 90 some odd days shooting, and it was grueling for me because uh, I, I didn't know how else to go through it except to, lived through the, Rupert and Jerry, and some of Sandra Bernhardt too, Masha. And so I was very um, uh, upset by the picture, uh, but I couldn't show that to them. Um, I was trying to keep a, um, a, 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 you know, a, 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 uh, my spirits up and that sort of thing, but it was a very disturbing film for me to make. Um, and so I think, um, uh, I think part of that had to do with my own fantasies of what um, uh, imagined lives would be, the imagined life of the celebrity, and then the truth of the celebrity life that Jerry reflects, um, the humor and the nastiness of it, which is, uh, you know, later on, you know, you'd be Jerry Lewis, Don Rickles, you get all of that uh, in there, that one has to, you know, uh, deal with the, that humor comes out of uh, very often other people's, other people's uh, problems, you know. And so um, uh, one has to not shy away from that. One has to understand that. Ultimately, I realized after the making of that film that um, uh, I, I better be on time from now on because when I get there, I still have to go through it. You still got to do the day, yeah. and you got to do the week, and then you got to do the month, and then you got to make the film, or you have to go to this event, or you have to go to a friend's uh, situation. Or you know, these days are terrible. But you go to funerals, you go to Ellen, you go to uh, memorial services. You've got to do it. And you might as well get there on time because it's not going to go away, you know. Uh, and so I, I was reticent on that film, and uh, they all wondered why. But I, uh, um, I had a hard time going, getting through it. Wow! And I mean, being possessed by those three characters—that's yeah, an incredibly intense it. thing. It no, sounds exhausting. Uh, it was very upsetting. Uh, the best part was finally the last few weeks. We, my mother uh, showed up in the film, and uh, she plays uh, Rupert's mother, the voice above, um, he's in his, his uh, basement, and that was a set. And we just put my mother in, uh, uh, up above, <laughs> and we just had her improvise. Um, she said, what's that noise down there? Who are you talking to? Who's this Gerald you're talking to? And at one point, he said, has so-and-so been down here? He mentions a name of his, he invented a brother that he had. I, you know, he, he, we improvised. And he said, is, is Gerald been down here? Or so, I forget his name. Has Sammy been down here? Uh, he's going into my things. I'm going to get a killer attack dog. And then we'll see. And she goes, good, another mouth to feed. <laughs> and then De Niro started laughing. And I never saw him crack up in the middle of a take. And he put his, he put his back to the camera, started shaking his shoulders, laughing. I said, what's he doing? <laughs> my mother would not take anything from him. Whatever was going on. So that opened up. But that was the last few weeks of shooting. But for me, I found that um, particularly the scene where he shows up at Jerry's house with Diane. And um, uh, they start dancing. Then Jerry shows up. And uh, it's mortifying. You know, I know it's a comedy of errors. I mean, it's a comedy of manners, right? Is that what you... I, yeah, yeah, yes. You know, and don't forget that film was a uh, complete... Um, uh, uh, 
disaster at the box office. No one went to see it in America. Um, it, it had a following in England. I remember. It was Straight after the release. Right after, yep. the, yeah. Yep. They, they liked it very much, picked up on it. But in America, what had happened with that picture was the, um, uh, right after Raging Bull, the film that uh, two years later to come out with De Niro and me directing, I think audiences expected um, uh, something more on the lines of Raging Bull, and they didn't, didn't want Rupert Pupkin at all. Yeah. So, in, in effect, um, I guess uh, he became, Rupert became, I think, our culture, really. In America, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's more and more relevant, I think, yeah, exactly. in many ways. I mean, reluctantly, because I know this is going to be the uh, challenge today. Sort of wanting to stay with subjects, but um, to try and keep uh, the the you know the, the what we want to get to. Um, I well, and 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 you've just been talking about your mother. I'm 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 interested. Uh, I mean, I come from a family who were not intellectuals and they weren't artists. So, uh, becoming a filmmaker, you know, I had to sort of you know, find in the dark myself how, how to be. And I wondered, it's similar for you. Not the well, same, exactly, obviously. Yes, it was. It was. I mean, naturally, they weren't... Um, they, were, they were born in the, um, on the streets, of, uh, in, in the tenements, uh, not in hospitals. Uh, they were the children of immigrants uh, from Sicily. And um, basically, they were only interested in survival in New York, um, didn't really go to school. So um, the art around me was through radio, television, when we had a TV. Um, the street, the street was, was very much great storytelling. Storytellers uh, uh, on the street corners or in, uh, in uh, sitting around the table at night, my, my mother telling stories, my father, my uncles, this sort of thing. Um, there was a cutoff. We were, there was another language issue, which I reacted against. I didn't want to learn the Sicilian. Uh, my grandparents seemed to be from another planet in a way. You, you didn't want to? No, learn. no, because oh. I, I sensed there was something else outside besides this world that they were in. Yeah, and part of that had to do with being, uh, uh, finding myself in the church around the corner, St. Patrick's Cathedral, a young priest who was like our mentor, who gave us Graham Greene to read, and um, uh, James Joyce. And so for me, I knew there was another world out there. And so I had to do this in a way um, on my own. Uh, we would see these films, come back to our apartment, my apartment, where I was living with my parents and my brother. And the best time for me was between 3 o'clock after school and 5.30 when my mother got home. Uh, and I would have to go down and help her with the groceries or whatever because they would buy all the groceries fresh right there. And um, between those two hours, within those two hours, I was able to draw little stories, little um, drawings. Um, later on, I realized that they were like storyboards, in a way. Uh, I was already planning camera moves and close-ups. The reason was that we couldn't afford a camera. And uh, I, I, a friend of mine down the block had a, had a camera. And so later on, I started playing with an eight millimeter camera. But primarily, it was my drawings, and in a way, um, I did it everything from, you know, the one three three aspect ratio, westerns, uh, all sorts of stories. Um, then um, widescreen hit, and I had longer widescreen, two five five aspect ratio, Roman epics, you know, which I never made finished. Made my own frames, yes, yes, yeah, and had my own little theater that I'd push it through. And I'd show it to only one person, one or two people, and um, uh, two of the more... Um, not street guys, they were more, uh, uh, more intellectual, put it that way. But they insisted that the, camera, that the images didn't move, and I insisted they did move. Right, right, right. They did, because you have to see, you have to go from the cut. In other words, the frame, not the next frame, so you have to imagine that the last frame now becomes this frame. Well, how did that happen? Is it a cut? Is it a move? And that sort of thing. And so, really, I was teaching myself all this. My parents, I would hide it from them because... Uh, so they didn't you see know, them. Yeah. No, I would hide them because... Uh, I was sick all the time, um, and you know, quite honestly, they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, my brother and, and uh, he was uh, he he had difficulties too, but uh, troublesome. Uh, you could see a lot of it's reflected in the movies I make. But the two brothers, he was seven years older than me. Uh, it was very loving the family, but he was a very at times sadly troubled guy. 
Um, and so it was a very difficult place. I didn't want anybody to see this stuff except two of my friends. And because my father saw me doing it once and he was concerned that, uh, you know... Uh, About what? Well, I brought into the house two books, one on the Russian Revolution by Alan Moorhead <laughs> and the other on Greek art. So what was he worried would happen? You're cutting paper dolls, he thought. You know, what are you doing? Who are you? What is this kid? You know, uh, what's he going to be? You know, this is 1951, 52. It's what? 73 years ago in a working class family, you know, it's not uh, And here they are the new generation. Who is this kid? You know, the older brother has troubles and this one is sick all the time He's in the corner drawing pictures and cutting pic cutting up uh, little pieces of paper in color. What the hell is that? <laughs> you know, and now he wants to then at when I went to NYU, which was at the time Washington Square College um, It was it was not the NYU of today in effect, um, you know, I'm not putting it down, but in effect, if you had the, if you were able to get the 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 the, the uh, tuition, you could go uh, to a certain extent. And I, I my my, uh, because I had been in a preparatory seminary for the priesthood and I got thrown out. My um, high school period, that middle school period, my grades weren't very good and I couldn't get into the Jesuit schools. And so I went to NYU because they also had this film department. They called it. And about a year into it, I, I was saying that I think I can make films. And uh, I heard, you know, th there was only three rooms, and I could hear them at night sometimes talking in, in the bedroom. And uh, I heard my mother say at one point, I think he's crazy. <laughs> I think he's crazy. But she didn't know. You see, it was 60 and 61, and Cassavetes had made Shadows. And Shirley Clark made, well, the connection is one thing, but then she made The Cool World. And all this incredible stuff was going on with the American underground and then um, the French New Wave and the Italian New Wave. You could get, and the Maisels and uh, Penny Baker and all these guys making films with the, the lightweight equipment. Well, that means that if you have something to say, you might be able to get it made. You don't have to go to California to get it made and work within the studio. And so there was a possibility. Although at NYU at the time, Haig Mnugin was our teacher, he would never... Uh, you know, uh, advocate making um, what we call now uh, uh, a melodrama. Uh, he said, if you come in with a script, first of all, you've got to bring your own script in. You don't come in and say, I'm a director, I need a script. You've got to write it yourself. And if you do, and if you put a gun in it, I'm throwing you out of class. <laughs> he said, because that, that, that doesn't work here. He said, make a film about what it is to eat an apple. Hmm, interesting. A five to six minute film. How do you do that? It's interesting. Yeah. You know, make a film, go, go to the, the, the Port Authority and work, see the guys on the docks and they're working, talk to them, go make a film on them, go make a, it was more documentary, it more came out of the, out of the American uh, depression period, the WPA, um, Leo Hurwitz and all these guys, George Stoney making these incredible documentaries of um, the, the, uh, that, that incredible movement that occurred under Roosevelt. You know, and so uh, Haig came so from he that. Was encouraging that, which yeah. I mean, not to bring it onto any of my work, but at film school, it's interesting because I I was being encouraged to make documentary like films, yeah. yes. and yeah. uh, but it wasn't where my uh, my my head was at all. So, I mean, uh, yeah. mine mine I, mine either. And um, um, luckily, I, I came in with a script um, in 1963 for a, a small workshop. That was called the summer workshop. Six weeks, you bring a script, you shoot it, you edit it, and then you cut the negative and you release, and there's a print. Um, and um, uh, maybe 30 young people would, would join up or, uh, for, that, for that class. Now, that class wasn't usually the, the, there during the year, during the re regular semesters. There was a special class. That's actually where I met uh, Thelma Schoonmaker. She was there in 63 at that one class. She, she never went to a film school that way. Um, but in that one class, I was able to bring a script in. Before the class was called, he said, OK, you can go ahead and direct it. Other people came in and said, we want to direct, but they weren't. They basically became, you know, said, OK, you're camera, you're on, you're on sound, you're on that sort of thing. And people always complained, oh, but I want to make a film. Well, you, you don't have a script. And so I made the script that way. And that actually was based on a, a, very, very, um, it was really an exploration of uh, film language and humor from uh, everything from the French New Wave to uh, 
there's a great American comedian named Ernie Kovacs and Mel Brooks, you know. And so all of this was together. So that at that point, these films and they started winning awards too. So that's when my parents thought that something was was could be taken seriously. Well, this is a good moment for the next clip. I, I was so struck when I watched uh, Who's That Knocking at My Door again recently by, um, well, a moment like that that has this uh, silence to it. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. That's the first time I've seen that since, uh, well, maybe 50 years. I don't know, maybe more. It, it, uh, I could have trimmed it. <laughs> um, and that was the, uh, we made that in 65, that scene. And then we um, reshot some scenes with Zena Bethune, which you'll see later in '67, and re-edited the film. The scenes with Zena were shot uh, in 16 millimeter, and the scenes that you saw just now was 35 millimeter, which was the first time a student film was being shot in 35 in NYU, and that was Harvey Keitel there, um, a guy named Lenny Curis and uh, a guy named Phil Carlson, I believe. In any event. Um, uh, I, um, I was obsessed with dissolves at the time, and I really liked the dissolves from the face, the sun, and that sort of thing. But in any event, um, yeah, it's based on something that, that happened to myself and my friends, and we went, this guy took us away uh, on a weekend up to a place called Copake, New York, and, and he had us climb up, and we saw the sunset, and it was beautiful, you know? I mean, shooting that, I didn't know how to shoot exteriors, because for me, an exterior... I mean, it's a joke, but it's true. An exterior for me is a long hallway with a light bulb because you come out of the apartment. So when you come out of the apartment, you're exterior. But that's a hallway. That's it. So apparently there's more outside. <laughs> you know, and so here, I mean, I find, you know, over the years I learned, but um, to have been put into to nature that way was something that was, uh, was, um, I was, I, it had a, a spiritual connection that um, I couldn't really, um, I couldn't really, I couldn't really, uh, uh, it, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't really explain it in any way. I, I, I didn't have the uh, 
the language for it except visually. And I had my close friend with me who was with me at the time was complaining about it all the time. And there was one, the one guy who took us up the mountain to take a look. A mountain for me, it's a hill, but it was very, very hard climbing. In fact, uh, after shooting that, the sun went down. The thing I didn't realize about exteriors is when the sun goes down, it gets dark. And then you have to go down the hill. <laughs> and it was dangerous. It was very dangerous, yeah. But there was that moment of peace and quiet, and then you cut to the city. I was interesting looking at the city again that way. Yeah. With and the, and the then the lighting of the candle. The lighting of the candle. Of Lawrence of Arabia, in a way. Oh, I wonder if you thought yeah. about that when you were doing that. Well, it, it, um, that's a holy candle. That's uh, in front of the Madonna that my mother had in her, uh, in her, uh, uh, in her room. Um, well, I like the way that, uh, well, later in the scene, uh, J.R., who's Harvey Keitel, um, complains about her using the candle. Oh, yeah, well, she it's a holy using candle. It because she, it's a holy she, candle. Yeah, and she, you know, it just, the film is, uh, in a sense, uh, it, it was an attempt. I, I had wanted so much to make a breakthrough film at the time. Ambition is so important. But on the other hand, it could be so destructive. And so um, ambition is good for, in a sense, never giving in and never giving up because you get discouraged all the way down the line for most, most that you do. Um, and so uh, uh, my ambition, though, at the time, wasn't well uh, connected with the, the period that the world was going through. And in fact, in this film, Keitel's character it falls in love with a young, young woman who is um, uh, it listed in the credits as the girl and always gets laughs when that comes up. Um, and uh, basically she comes from outside his world. And part of that is um, he's, he's playing a Sicilian-American like myself, and she's blonde hair, blue-eyed, more Nordic, um, and um, doesn't know his culture, doesn't understand his culture, and he doesn't know the outside world yet. And he's very naive, he's still very much a child. Um, and so for her to, to light a candle thinking it's romantic, it's, and it's a holy candle, I mean, it's out of the question. And, and this film, um, you wrote, you weren't collaborating with another writer, were you, that you wrote this completely on your own? Yes, yeah. And I, I, my old friend, uh, Armenian uh, friend of mine, Marduk Martin, would always be with me, and we'd work together. Oh, okay, and yeah. then you went on to Mean Streets yeah, yeah, together. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 I knew this would happen. The time is going so quick. Can we just not slow it down? Because um, there's so many things... Um, um, wanted to yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's a 1750... What is it? Oh, it's five, six o'clock already? I can't believe it. Uh, I, I, I mean, if it, I don't think we can go onto this quickly, but I suppose I was one of the reasons I wanted to show that clip was to move into the realm of the spiritual and move on to your later films and obviously um, The Last Temptation of Christ, which I rewatched um, the other day, and I'm still haunted by it. It's such, mm. uh, um, I mean, it's such a beautiful, important film in so many ways. And Willem Dafoe, I don't know, did he... Did yes. he, I don't think he got any awards for that, but no, he should have nobody, done. No, everyone, uh, everyone um, rejected the picture except um, the director's branch of the Academy nominated me for directing. But what they did, in effect, was nominate themselves because if I was kept from saying this in public or making a film like that, that would be the end of what they would be able to do. And Stan so they had to support you. Um, and that was wonderful. That was yeah. Everyone else uh, shunned us completely. Uh, for that film, yeah. um, but you know the the problem. The, the, it seems that even beyond filmmaking, the issue for me has always been um, that peace, um, a spiritual uh, comfort that I found inside that. It's now called a basilica of St. Patrick's Old Cathedral. And it's rather important for me because that was the first Catholic cathedral in New York. It was built in 1810, so for America, that's very very old. And, um, um, you know, it's a very important church. It uh, was under fire by the um, um, isolationists and um, um, basically uh, racist uh, groups in 1844 called the Know Nothings and the Wide Awakes with the eye looking around. We, we, ask, we have certain aspects of that in gangs of New York. In any event, uh, they wanted Catholics out. They didn't want any Catholics in there. And um, that was the first cathedral in, in New York uh, for Catholics. And so for me, I found um, uh, coming from, it's a little bit of a connecting issue here, 
in that I was born in 42 in, a, in a Queens, Queens, New York. My parents, when they got married, moved out of the neighborhood, moved out of the Lower East Side, which was, you know, tenements and difficulties and all kinds of problems, and got a nice little two-family house in Corona, Queens. And I grew up for the first five or six years of my life, maybe seven years, in Queens, and it was so nice. Um, uh, there were trees and, and everything, even though I was allergic to them. I got very bad asthma at that time, and that had to be taken care of all the time. I was kept, I was kept from doing any sports or any running, or even, his, even spasmodic laughter, because that could cause problems with the lungs. But my father got into a big fight with the landlord, and uh, we were forced to move out. And we were thrown back to the place that they were born in, on Elizabeth Street. And so the shock, the trauma from going from something that I imagine still in my child's mind as idyllic to basically the dead end kids or like um, basically a Bruegel painting uh, thrown right in the center of it, you know, and, which is actually full of life and that sort of thing, but it was pretty terrifying. And so for me, um, the church represented a kind of uh, comfort. And I, I, there was one particular priest who was very young who came into the neighborhood, um, and he started to talk to us uh, and, and open the world up to us, really. Um, when you say us, you... And myself and a few friends of mine, right. yeah, yeah. And there was another group of friends who were not necessarily street-tough kids. They were kids who went on to uh, Fordham University and other universities. But, but um, the place was rife with, you know, it just... I have to say, there were representatives of the five crime families in New York on every corner. Uh, to this day, I can't tell you who they were or what it was because I was growing up with them um, and we just knew that that's where the power was. And, you know, we had to be very respectful and we had to be very careful on certain, for certain issues and certain people. But uh, not everybody wound up there. Others went to school, others and the priest came in and said, no, no, don't go there. You know, and also don't necessarily, you know, it, there was another way of thinking and this has to do with the spirituality, in that um, if you're the son, of, uh, son or daughter of immigrants, um, uh, the automatic thing was like the old world of Sicily was to, at the age of 21, 22, get married and have a family. And he said, that's not necessarily the way in this country. There's another world out there. Learn more, read more, go to places, meet other people, learn other cultures, then maybe settle down if you can. And so... Um, that was, a, that was an eye-opening experience. So for me, the spirituality, I wanted to be like him. And so I thought I'd be a priest. And um, it took me three or four months at that seminary to realize that, you know, you need more than that to uh, take on uh, a role that, that as a spiritual advisor to other people in life. It's about other people, not yourself. You see, it isn't saving yourself. I mean, that's, to a certain extent it is, but it has to do with others, not you. And I was completely bereft. I was thrown out, and I, was, I didn't know what to do. And I went to a Catholic high school. And during that high school, which, by the way, is the end of Killers of the Flower Moon, is shot in that high school on the radio show. Actually, they have a stage like this, even bigger. And so um, that high school kind of straightened me out in a way. And that led the way to cinema. But the spiritual quest, or the, the search, never left. And somehow... Uh, it, it's reflected in that scene I haven't seen in, as I say, 50 some odd years. Well, it's reflected in, in all your films and having uh, rewatched a lot of them. I mean, the, your, your curiosity about different cultures, that advice you were given uh, was um, uh, about going into the priesthood. It completely applies to your body of work. I mean, in a way that I, 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 uh, I, I only feel that now, just having watched so many of the films, and, and it's really interesting when you watch a a filmmaker's work in, in quite a concentrated amount of time, you really get a sense, I feel I've really got a sense of you and what your quest was and is, in a way. Well, it's, it's been a long, um, yeah, long ride, long journey, and we took a lot of wrong turns, you know, but, um, you know, we even took those moments where De Niro says, you know, I got some bad ideas in my head. We felt that way when we made that film. Um, we felt that way when we did Raging Bull, but at the end of Raging Bull, he's able to sit there in a mirror and look at himself and be at some kind of peace, at least to the people around him, if not to himself. So the whole idea is forgiving yourself. 
That's one thing before you can forgive others. Um, you know, and so it's a very interesting whether whether the word forgiveness comes in to play at all, if, if, as if it means that who are you to judge in that sense too. But um, in the case of Lamada, he was very, very judgmental that way in the character we created. Yeah. And by the end of the picture, he is, he is, uh, he's reached some kind of um, peace. But even when I made that film, I didn't have it at the time. In other words, I was trying to get there to be able to look in the mirror, mm. you see. I mean, it's pain, painful to watch that uh, scene when he's uh, in the jail yeah. and yeah. He's, uh, hate, he's so right. self-destructive yeah. Yeah. and hitting yeah. himself against the yeah. wall. It's really, I mean, I find it really upsetting and made me quite tearful. To, I mean, it's yeah. very emotional because yeah. you realize that all the hatred that he's been hitting out at other people is just all inside himself. It's all inside himself, yeah. I mean, uh, even on the set that day, my father was there and because uh, he's in the film and... Uh, the two guys who played the uh, the real guards, they're really prison guards, they were they were shocked mm. by what, what he did in there. And, and uh, you could feel it in the, the whole set, just went to silence and quiet, you know, and it was a beauty, and we really worked. Mm. Um, but that spiritual, um, uh, it seems the balance is, is always gone towards that. I think, and uh, what I mean is that the projects that I've chosen or that have been that I've had to be involved in usually has an element of that in them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, even the lack thereof, like in Wolf of Wall Street, which is really about you know where you have a, a society where uh, the morality is so um, uh, corrupted uh, and there's such a lack of spirituality mm -hmm. that uh, you want to go there to find out how we fill that. How, how, how we come to terms with that, you know. But the danger sometimes, especially uh, when I was starting out, to go into dangerous areas, you, you may not come out. You just may not come out. You may not make it. Um, and that's no matter, you know, you're self-destructive in any which way, whether it's being self-destructive just generally or whether you uh, succumb to drink or drugs or that sort of thing. And you're, you're, it's a miracle that you get out of it, you know. But I, I needed, I felt, to know where I was and how deep or how low the level could be reached, you see, what, what the lowest level could be. But it's just an amazing thing that suddenly you're still awake. And now what? <laughs> now there has to be another reason, and we go further. Yeah. And then you're, another thing happens, and you're still awake, and you go further. Yeah. And a lot of people I know who didn't wake up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're still very much awake, and we're <laughs> very yeah, happy you are. And uh, uh, I mean, yeah, the, I think we need to move on to, to the next clip. Um, but yes, you are uh, just as uh, well, I did want to ask, I don't know if have got time to go further on this, but you are uh, on this spiritual quest you're about to make. Oh, and well, again, again, it's, it's a, uh, a possible um, after after making the film Silence. Um, I, I, it took me quite a number of years to be able to come to terms with the script of Silence because I didn't quite fully know how to handle the scene in which he apostatizes where Jesus tells him, step on me, that's why I was, that's why I was created. And um, uh, I know that he found something deeper and I want to go there now. And I don't know what it is, I'm not quite sure, but I think part of it is re-examining or trying to come to terms with um, the 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 uh, the idea of uh, of 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 um, um, a, a sort of universal compassion, and I think I try to deal with that in Kundun also. But here, I think it has to do with um, uh, the for me, it's the concept of Jesus, this idea of Jesus, who he is, what is he, and what does it mean to me personally. And why am I going there? Maybe I'll find the way. I don't think I'll find an answer, but I'm, I'm going to try to um, maneuver my way through it uh, to maybe come to some sort of um, uh, uh, a sense of peace, really. Or at least some sort of comfort, not for myself, but for others, we hope. Sometimes, sometimes these things speak to other people, too. I mean, silence did. Less temptation did. Many people told me that. Uh, others, not. But... That's all I know, really. Uh, let's have the next clip. Thank you. 
This is, yeah, just settle into this one. Oh, this is longer. Yeah.
Oh. It's a hard one to sit through for me. I haven't seen that since I made it. No. Um, uh, the two things about that, I was talking earlier about ambition, and um, I wanted to, to create something as, uh, uh, you know, as I saw Before the Revolution by Bertolucci and the Fist in the Pocket by Bellocchio, and I wanted to make something as powerful as that immediately. And this is the story I came up with, but um, I think I had to live more in order to, I um, mean, experience more in order to, to make Mean Streets, for example, which was made eight years later. But um, the thing about this, too, was that this film comes out. Uh, I remember my guys, at, my agents at the time, were laughing because they said, here's, here's the world that, you know, uh, 1968, 69 is the height of the sexual revolution, and you have a film about a guy who loves this woman so much he won't make love to her. And they said it's going to be laughed at. And so that's the nature of it. Um, the one who really kept me going with it was um, my friend Jay Cox and his wife Verna. They showed it to John Cassavetes. And Cassavetes liked this scene a lot. And I used to talk about the scene where um, in Invasion of the Body Snatchers by Don Siegel version, the Don Siegel version, where uh, Kevin McCarthy um, kisses uh, uh, Faith Demerig, and he realizes, as she pulls away, he realizes she's been overtaken by the pod people, and she's changed. And I said, I always thought that's an amazing moment. And Cassavetes told me, well, this one, this kiss is better when she pulls away from him. And he said, no, you mustn't be embarrassed by this. This is, this yeah. is genuine. And he was the one, based on this scene and these sequences in the film, who encouraged me to, to make, ultimately make Mean Streets based on this. Uh, I, it's, um, it's incredibly genuine. And, and in that scene, which is why it was necessary to show the whole of it, there's, there's so many changes that take place because at first you think they're going to they're gonna get together and then they move away. And the, and the, the whole um, choreography of it is really right. interesting. Yeah. And then I know you get a certain amount of criticism for your female characters, but they're, they're so, um, she's so uh, interesting and so strong and such, and he's, he's um, crumbling and questioning, and it, it's, it's, the, the dynamic is really interesting. And then I, you know, then I think of your other films later on, New York, New York, which is very much about tussle between two creative people trying to... Yeah keep it together and, and, and just the male female relationships through your films are so so strong but I know you know you, people tend to think oh the you know the well, I mean, a lot of, all a lot the, of the, but it's the vulnerability uh, that's so strong yeah I mean a lot of the films I made are, have um, uh, depict worlds in which the men usually uh, dictate uh, the action and um, not all of them but many do and they they stand out I guess but um, uh, this was the beginning of it for me um, I carried it through to um, um, Mean Streets is very little of it, but in Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, and then in Taxi Driver, where it becomes abstracted, or she becomes the obsession. Um, but then we try to follow it through in, in New York, New York. And um, I'm not sure if we, 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 um, we were successful or not with that one. Um, but in any I event, think you were. I yeah. mean, I love I love that film, and I know you. Whenever I yeah. mention that, I feel that I'm mentioning one of the yeah the the, the less loved ones of yours. But I, I, I... well, the, the problem sometimes for me is that um, uh, you know, like last night, looking at all those uh, pictures up there and all the titles of the films, and you know, each one is a separate, like for me, universe. I, I go there and I, I lived in it, and um, sometimes. I, I feel that, um, uh, you know, some I don't want to revisit uh, because it's revisiting when the film was made and the people I knew and how things worked and how they didn't work and that sort of thing. And this, it's not, you know, uh, you look at a film, you'll, you'll see a classic film today and people, oh, it was terrible behind the scenes. People weren't along, getting along. Nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. But I have the right to say, listen, I don't want to, I don't want to have to sit through that again or to be reminded of it. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean it was, it was a, um, uh, a terrible experience. It's just that the emotion and the, 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 the psychological traumas that we were going through, I just don't want to do it again. I want to move on, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really understand that, that each film is, is a part of your life and things yes. were going on yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And so one d can't disassociate the film itself 
with what was going on. As no, you I say. can't. I can't. Yeah. You know, yeah. and um, it just happens that certain films were that way. Like The Color of Money for me is, I think, an interesting film, but it was a very sad period in my life. And the film is, I think, a very sad film. It has a... Um, uh, it was a the, the fun of that was Michael Ballhouse on camera and Paul Newman, Tom Cruise, Mary Elizabeth, uh, the, the, the crew, um, uh, the cast, uh, Richard Price's script. Um, but I shot it quickly. I came in a day under and a million dollars under budget. Um, but I couldn't go any further with it. Um, I, I like it, but I don't really... Hmm. I, I was a, it was a difficult period of my personal life, I think, when I was making the film. Mm. And so I don't have very uh, many uh, good memories about it, except for being on the set and shooting, and then editing the film with Thelma, and that was it. You know. Mm -hmm. Whereas Last Temptation of Christ was an absolute appalling situation, but I could watch that. Oh, yeah, okay. that, one, that one, interesting, I could watch certain sections of it. Um, not the whole thing? Not necessarily, not, not the whole thing, no. Um, um, we've got time uh, for, for one more clip, uh, which is really important to get to because it's um, Martin's most recent film uh, from Killers of the Flower Moon. And, uh, and yeah, talking of male female relationships.
Thank you. That, that's interesting. It's very reminiscent of the sunset. And who's at knocking? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, um, again, uh, I, I know, as I say, I, I've been, I'm allergic to so many things and asthma, and I was never supposed to go outside, but I, I relish the, uh, the, the sense of nature, and I envy those who can really appreciate it and live in it. Um, and so in this film, there's this moment and that came by, um, I was talking to, um, or they were talking to me, actually a, a man who was a lawyer, a man named uh, um, Winston Pipestem, who was uh, warning us and telling us that you have to be very, very careful the kind of, the way you, pre the way you present the Osage in this film. And uh, this was the very, very beginning of, shoot, uh, when we had just gone there for uh, location scouting. And he said, you don't understand Bill Hale and, Henry Rowan, they were best friends, and I was picking up all this information. Then later on, he told me something else. You don't understand about our culture, he said. For example, when I was a young kid, about five or six, I'd be running around my house, and my grandma would be there, and, and then one day I was running around. She'd go, stop it, stop it, sit, sit still. I said, there's a storm coming. And she said, sit and be quiet, and let the blessing of the storm that Wakanta is giving us, let it wash over us. And we had to sit and let the storm pass and relish, uh, actually appreciate, appreciate um, the blessing of nature in that respect. And so I said, that's, I said to myself, that's great, that's the way this scene should end. And we put it in the picture, because originally the scene was they were drinking, and, and uh, some, he gets drunk, and she can hold her liquor, and that sort of, so no, this is more interesting. But it's that sense of... It says of, so much also about the different cultures. The totally different culture, yeah, and he, um, it's... Um, uh, in the sense, I found with the Osage, um, it's a sense of giving, giving away, giving gifts, giving. And, and um, uh, Leo's group, it's taking, taking, you know? And so um, uh, the dynamic between the two of them is really interesting, too. She knows he's, he's, he's just ne'er-do-well. He's, a, he's a, uh, a rascal, you know? Yet... Yeah. She loves yeah, him. She, yeah, 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 and it's based on the real, uh, real relationship that did end, by the way, with her um, still attending the trial. You know, she only left him after he was convicted. So that was it. That they broke up. But um, uh, she really trusted him. She really trusted him, um, and he loved her. And this was the. This is what we also found out from the Osage. Um, and so that's what we thought would be the way into the story, you follow, rather than coming from the outside in, from the uh, Bureau of Investigation coming in and doing a police procedural, trying to find out who did it. We always used to say, when I read the book and I, I started talking to the people, I said, it's not a matter of who did it, who didn't do it. It's who didn't do it. We all did it. And, and so I said, well, that, then that's, the story's got to come from, we know who did it. All of us. But the love story uh, became, beca wasn't what you intended right at the beginning? No, that not at all. No, no, no. I, I was finding my way through with uh, Eric Roth on the script, and we were basing it on the book by David Gran, but that was from the outside in. And by meeting the Osage and listening to them and working on the script and working on it, working on it, and then finally Leo and I meeting, and Leo said, where's the heart of the film? And I said, the heart is really this love story. And he said, well, then I, I think I should play, instead of the FBI guy, I should play Ernest. And I said, all right. And at that point, we just took the script and changed it completely. And then COVID hit. And so I had a lot of time to sit there with the script um, and, you know, think about how to um, tell the story um, through this love story and have everything around it as normal life, so to speak. Instead, it's a, it's a, it's a genocide, basically. Well, uh, it's a, a good point to stop. I think we have to stop. You've got to go and do some other things. And uh, the time has gone incredibly quickly. But um, if any of you haven't seen Killers of the Flower Moon, you must, uh, I don't know if it's already been released here. Presumably, it's been released in Germany. Is it yeah. now? I don't know. Has but, it been uh, released? You, you yes, need okay. to see it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but. Um, but can we all give a, an incredibly no, thank uh, you. big thank, thank you. you so much?
Thank you so much. Thank you.